or to start our broadcast in our stream in a minute. Uh, good afternoon, dear friends. Uh, you're welcome. Ukraine Media Center continues its work. We are supported by the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine and Ministry of Internal Affairs of Ukraine. We are hosted by Skyloft Hotel, and we'd like to thank them for that. And right now with us, we have Vadim Boychenko online, city mayor of the city of Mariupol. Uh, Vadim, you're Hello. Hello. Uh, we all see, we all have been monitoring the situation uh, with evacuation of civilians from Mariupol. What's the situation at the moment? The situation was and is very difficult because all our intentions we had since the very beginning of this war uh, depend, all our plans depend on those invaders who Unfortunately, uh, announce evacuation every time and then uh, block it. For example, today it was announced that there will be many buses. Uh, I would not even quote the numbers, but unfortunately, it did not happen because there were just seven buses. And of course, we expected to have more, but those buses did not come. And also, uh, in addition, uh, they had to tell us clearly uh, what would be the route so that we would, uh, so that more people would board those buses on the way. And there w should be much more, there should have been much more, many more of those buses. But they did not uh, plan it. And uh, those buses only evacuated. Uh, you know, there are the left bank. Uh, part of our city, which is cut off the rest of the city, and it was very difficult to get there to, to, to start a vacation. But people reached that starting point, marked as starting point of that vacation. But at, this, uh, at, at that time, some combat action started. There was artillery shelling, and there were tanks uh, attacking the defenders of our city. So the scared people uh, had to make a decision for themselves whether they should go or not. And unfortunately, many people decided to stay in the city because they thought that it would be dangerous for their lives to live. But still, four buses did leave. And by today, uh, you know, they spent a long time on the way. They spent a night in Berdyansk. And by today, they reached another point on the map, which is Vasilivka. And in that village of Vasilivka, uh, they now uh, crossed into Ukrainian control territory and now they're moving to the bridge. We are very glad to hear it. Uh, do we know how many people you managed to evacuate? All together, over all this time, in those difficult conditions, uh, and I, I'd like to emphasize that now everything depends on our so-called liberators, but uh, actually they are occupiers who have destroyed our city. And uh, more than 100,000 people are uh, like captured by them. But since the 13th of March, when it became possible, when there was that first vacation mission, uh, we, uh, supported by uh, the minister in charge, Irina Verichuk, and Paolo Kirilenko, the governor of our oblast, and by our president, Vladimir Zelensky, we all joined efforts towards this goal, and by now more than 100,000 uh, people have already reached uh, the territory controlled by the central government. Those four buses are not a lot. Uh, that's a small part of the mission that has already happened. Uh, these are 80 residents of Mariupol who have already arrived to the uh, government-controlled part of Ukraine. But we are glad to see it. That means that we have saved 80 more of Mariupol residents. Vadim. Uh, today, you know, we saw some statement that uh, we expect for so-called humanitarian corridor to operate also today, if you can call it humanitarian corridor. Has it uh, been operated? Do you have any information about that? 
I'll emphasize again that since the very first days of March, early March, uh, you know, uh, there was this opportunity to start a vacation, like uh, there was a point on the map, you all heard about that vacation, people would gather at those points, but then uh, some shelling would start, our buses would be destroyed, and so residents of Mariupol were not able to leave. And so in that way, until the 10th of March, they uh, damaged, they destroyed all the buses owned by the city, and in that way, uh, they, they blocked evacuation from Mariupol. Now, unfortunately, something similar is happening. I have been seeing for a second day running that again we announced that there will be vacation. We established the starting point, some point of the map of Mariupol. People gather there today. More than 200 residents of Mariupol have been waiting for this vacation. They don't know whether it will happen or not. Somebody approached them and said that they will be treated personally, like uh, only women with children will be entitled, <coughs> then women without children and elder people. So there is some sort of uh, priorities and that uh, cure for evacuation. Uh, but now by 3.05, by this time, unfortunately, we don't see any buses in that point which we marked as a starting port point. We expect that those troops will uh, allow us to evacuate local residents of Mariupol. And, and we establish this route. And it was said that we will be able to have more people to board the buses in Mangush and then near Berdyansk and then move to Zaporizhia. But at the moment, there are no buses at the starting point. We are waiting. We have asked for 22 buses who had to come at 2 p.m., and now we have 3.05, and there are no buses still. And people gathered there, people have been waiting, and unfortunately nothing is happening, but we are waiting. Mr. Boychenko, we know and we see it here that in Mangush, uh, 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 they uh, are somehow uh, mocking our people, and the people are registered for so-called filtration. Uh, so uh, do you think the occupiers try to prevent people from living on the mass scale, or what is this procedure, why they have introduced it? This procedure is about, uh, about creating obstacles for evacuation to Ukraine. Uh, through this more difficult procedure with this filtration. Like, if you were related in any way to any civil service, to municipal service, you will become a, you will be captured immediately. And somebody, some people are uh, kept as prisoners for two weeks, some people are kept for two months. And, like, uh, we clearly treat it as torture. Unfortunately, many residents of Mariupol have already become victims to this torture, to this uh, sort of uh, barbaric treatment. And not only males, but also women fall victims to it. And those people who pass through that crime, that filtration, uh, they uh, witness uh, what they saw. And it's terrible. There is nothing humane in that. They said we are liberators, but we see it as a genocide, as a war crime. This is some sort of ghetto. They placed four centers for hubs around the city, operating around the city. For example, I have a neighbor uh, who has registered for this filtration, and his number is 3620. So there is a wait long waiting line for that filtration. And the neighbor uh, uh, says that, you know, maybe uh, he will go through the filtration in uh, with this speed, he will be uh, able to do, go to Ukraine control part in December 24. You know, this is about torture. This is about fascist method. This is like, like methods used by fascist Germany back then and now by fascist Russia. Mr. Boychenko, could we ask you whether you confirm information which appeared earlier today on some media uh, that uh, near Mangush some mass 
uh, graves have been found where Rocky Pires uh, buried bodies of our people brought from Mariupol. Unfortunately, I do confirm this information. I confirm it. We see, we, uh, you and we uh, see that for a second week running, the city has been closed and nobody is allowed into the city. And now they are trying to hide the traces of crime committed by the Russian Federation in the city of Mariupol. According to our estimates, and those are optimistic estimates, uh, 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 more than you know, ten, more than 10,000 local civilians uh, died in the streets of our city because of enemy's artillery. And, and our directors of our utilities saw it personally. Uh, uh, directors of our municipal company saw it. And unfortunately, we see that the dead bodies of those residents of Mariupol have started disappearing from the streets. And our residents provide us with information, but this is a very uh, it is very dangerous to uh, pass this information to us, but uh, for us to disseminate this information. Because, you know, uh, it's about a war crime, and uh, the invaders try to hide those war crimes. They use three tools. First of all, those are mass graves. We were looking where it would start, and we see that it already started. Around Mangus, there is a circle road. And from the left side, uh, uh, there is a gas station, oak gas station, petrol station, and uh, next to that station there is an old cemetery and a field next to the cemetery. And in this uh, field they are digging trenches, huge trenches, 30 meters long. And then bring those dead bodies of Mariupol residents there and throw them into those trenches. Sorry, the interpreter cannot hear, the sound dropped. Mr. Boyachenko, we seem to have lost connection for a minute. Just a moment, we have been trying to restore the connection. Mr. Boyachenko, can you hear us? Let's try and reconnect. Ah, now you're with us. We managed to restore the connection. We can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are problems with communications. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Seems that the connection has been restored, but its quality is rather bad. Can you hear us, Mr. Boychenko? Let's try and reconnect. Dear colleagues, please try and reconnect for to restore normal connection. And in the meantime, I will remind you that in our studio, uh, we uh, have online connection with the head of the city of Mariupol. Vadim, you're welcome. So please can repeat your question. We lost connection when you were telling us about that symmetry and that the invaders are digging trenches there. Yes, there is a uh, circular road around the town of Mangosh. And on the left side, there is Oka petrol station. And there is an old symmetry. And next to that symmetry, there is a field. And in that field, they're digging uh, a uh, huge trench at 30 meters long, and they uh, bring in big trucks dead bodies of our residents killed by Russian troops. And uh, they're burying them there, bur hiding traces of their war crimes. And uh, 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 we uh, asked Maxar to confirm it with their satellite images. I cannot but ask you what the information, what sort of information we have from Azov Stal steel factory. What's happening there? What about civilians hiding there? Unfortunately, today we cannot evacuate innocent civilians, civilian residents of Mariupol from Azov Stal steel factory. You see, we ask for stable ceasefire. We need at least one day to be able 
to tell our residents who have been hiding there for 57 days Yeah, now we can hear you. Yeah. So we need a we need, we need a stable ceasefire. Unfortunately, you know, for 57 days, the city is bombed, and those places where residents are hiding are bombed, and we have all international parties involved. We ask for that ceasefire, for us to announce. Uh, local residents to establish the uh, location, the point where uh, we would start the evacuation. For, for us to be able to start that evacuation, and then we would start and evacuate local residents to the government-controlled part of Ukraine. We ask everybody, yesterday uh, President Zelensky proposed and other leaders uh, leaders of negotiations offered various exchanges and so on. But we have to understand that the uh, only uh, the president of that criminal government, Vladimir Putin, believes he has the right to Mariupol. Thank you, Vadim. And uh, I'd like to let journalists here in the studio ask their questions. Please introduce yourself and speak into the microphone. I'm Rula Al Khatib from Al Arabiya and Al Hadath News Channel. Uh, we came from Dubai. We need, uh, I have a couple of questions for you first. What's your first comment about, the Rus about what the Russians said that they occupied whole Mariupol and are getting ready for a parade? This is the first question. The second question How long do you think uh, the Azov and the civilians? can survive inside Azovstal after Putin announced that they'll put them under siege. Uh, what do they have inside to survive from food, electricity, water? And uh, we would like to know the numbers, uh, related the exact numbers of civilians there and the Azov fighters. In addition, please, uh, it was not clear for me, the number of the people in Mariupol who were evacuated till now, evacuated, the number of the killed uh, civilians and the number of people who are still in Mariupol. Thank you. I will start from your last question. As soon as the invasion started, uh, there was still, it was still possible for people who decided to leave Mariupol you know, some of them would live in their own cars, some of them would use trains who were, which were still moving until the time when the Russian troops destroyed uh, this possibility. So for that time, since the beginning of the invasion, about 100,000 people left Mariupol, 100,000. Then the Russian troops captured the whole Mar uh, Mariupol. The whole Mariupol became like prisoners. We were waiting. We launched various missions about evacuation. But as soon as people would uh, reach the first roadblock, the first checkpoint, uh, we would be told by those invaders that we don't have any instruction for you to leave the city. So get back to the city. That's what they told the people. So on the 13th of March, when all our international partners joined efforts for one goal, for one end, for residents of Mariupol to be able to evacuate. But, you know, without ceasefire. At that time, on the 13th of March, I personally led that mission. But we did not get to the city of Mariupol to enable it. And, but they opened uh, this opportunity, and now residents started leaving the city using their private cars. And by now, until today, uh, the number of people who left Mariupol to government-controlled part of Ukraine is in excess of 100,000 people. Now around the city, in Berdyansk, in villages, there are 50 more, 50,000 people who are waiting for vacation. 
There are also people forcefully evacuated to Russian Federation through that filtering. Uh, it's actual deportation, and the number of people uh, transported to Russian Federation or so-called Donetsk People's Republic is more than 40,000 residents of Mariupol. And in the city, we now have more than 100,000 people. The city was and is and remains the Ukrainian city, because now our brave defenders, our heroes, our warriors are defending it as much as possible. They are defending our city. So, you know, whatever statements are made, the city is and will be Ukrainian city. But we still ask, you know, everybody, the international community should join efforts to one, f towards one goal. The local residents, which are under threat of uh, elimination of killing there in Azovstal, they should be, they should live. So we ask for a ceasefire, at least for one day, for us to be able to make announcements to those residents of Mariupol hiding in shelters in Azovstal, for them to leave to some place. And our warriors would also live with their weapons. Now they are defending it, but you know, that these are the only conditions upon which they are ready and we are ready. And now there have been negotiations running on various levels for it to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? You are welcome. Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's uh, Luke Harding here from The Guardian newspaper. Um, the, the Russians seem to have their own new mayor of Mariupol. They seem to have got rid of you and replaced you with something else, with someone else. Can you speak to what the Russians do in areas they occupy in terms of creating political structures, replacing elected officials with their own people? What's happening in Mariupol and what does this say about, about their methods in occupied areas? Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. Their methods were and still are the same since the beginning of 2014. So, those leaders who wanted to have so-called Donetsk People's Republic in Mariupol, is Mariupol did not surrender in 2014. But I would like to remind you that for two months again, Mariupol was occupied by so-called Donetsk People's Republic, but they did not surrender. And back then, those leaders of so-called Donetsk People's Republic, back then and now, they are the same people, that the same situation. So what, what they did? Uh, they used so-called opposition uh, block for life, political party. They used local elections. They brought their local leaders hiding within the ranks of that party. Before that, they were uh, under the previous mayor. They were in government positions. And unfortunately, I have to say that they were uh, adjusting people, uh, Russians' fire against infrastructural sites. And in that way, we have lost our electricity supply, we have lost our water supply, our heating supply, our natural gas supply, our food supply. They were shelling everything, and they were adjusting the Russian shelling. And they were also targeting that Russian fire on evacuation buses, which since the very first days of March until the 10th of March, they destroyed more than 100 buses which we wanted to use in evacuation. And it was done by so-called by, by Mr. Harmeshev and Mr. Ivashenko from so-called Opposition Block for Life Party. They said that now they are the local authorities here. What they are doing now, the first thing they started doing is now jointly with Russian uh, occupational forces, they destroyed the evidence, destroyed, destroyed the trace of their own war crimes. As we understand, they have been burying those dead bodies, and we know where they are burying those dead bodies to hide their war crimes. So those collaborators have now been helping uh, Russian troops, the occupiers. Thank you. Any more questions? You're welcome. Just uh, one, one clarification um, on numbers. At the beginning, you said that the four buses had left with 80 people. 
uh, I'm assuming that's yesterday uh, and not today. And, and to be clear on the number of civilians still in Mariupol, um, is, it, is it right to say there are about a thousand civilians inside the steel factories still? And I think according to your figure, about a hundred thousand still in the city outside the steel factory. Have I got that correct? 100,000 local residents are remaining, are staying in the occupied Mariupol. In Azovstal steel factory, it's difficult to calculate, it's difficult to count, but according to our estimates, there are 300 to 1,000 residents hiding there, 300 to 1,000. For us to be able to count them, we have to have a ceasefire at least for one day, for us to see whether they are alive or not, for us to count, to calculate, to count how many of them are there, still there. Because unfortunately now there is still shelling, there is still bombing and all that, so it's impossible to count people for you to understand. Now, in Mariupol, I, I, I am to emphasize, uh, with the help of so-called leaders of that opposition bloc for life, who now became so-called local authorities, more than 20,000 residents have been killed in Mariupol. In the city itself, there are still 100,000 people remaining. Yesterday, unfortunately, it was announced that there would be many buses, that there would be wide-scale evacuation just before Easter, which is a great holiday. There would be a large-scale evacuation, there would be many buses, but there were just seven buses arriving and just four buses uh, reached the end point. And there were just 80 residents of Mariupol, but we thank even for those, because it means 80,000 lives rescued. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Boychenko. Thank you for finding time to join us on the air. Thank you. Dear friends, I would like to remind you that uh, you have to, uh, you're welcome to monitor our announcements. We are developing our schedule for tomorrow. Stay with us. Thank you. Bye.